Hey everybody, uh, it's Sean. Uh, Friday, uh, welcome to our Friday 2.30 p.m. afternoon reading. And uh, before we get started, uh, just to let you know, I know some of you already know this, uh, the video I'm gonna make is also gonna be available on my YouTube channel afterwards, uh, a little bit later this afternoon. And then uh, you can also watch it on my Sean Forstler Realtor page on Facebook, which is where I'm streaming from now. Um, so uh, yeah, I think I think that's it for right now. So uh, last week we read, so we've read some nonfiction, we've read some science, and uh, we did a tale last week about Balto the dog. So this week, um, and then I read Volcanoes. I don't know if you were with me the first time. We did Volcanoes the first time I did this. And uh, the book is the book we're going to read today is called Icebergs and Glaciers. It's another Seymour Simon book. And the one on Volcanoes I read was also by Seymour Simon. And I like his books. They're, he has great photographs and uh, good information. Not too much information, but just enough so you kind of learn a little bit about the different subjects. Um, he's got one on earthquakes, weather, and all that, and we'll get to that, you know, in, in time. Um, also, real quickly before I get started with the reading, I am going, I have a good friend who's a school teacher, and she sent me a link today uh, with some good lessons and uh, activities for students. So I'm going to also post that on my Facebook uh, after this. So you can access that for some um, different things you can do with your kids while school is out. All right, so Icebergs and Glaciers, Seymour Simon. All right. So there's a dedication to my new friends in Ketchikan, Alaska. So that's a small town. I think it's in the Alaskan Panhandle. All right. For most of us, spring means the return of warm weather. Snows melt and frozen lakes and rivers thaw. The icy scenes of winter begin to disappear but some places are cold all year round. This photo was taken at midnight during the middle of summer in Antarctica. That's the South Pole. At that time of year, the sun never sets during the night, but remains low in the sky. Antarctica is always covered by deep layers of ice and snow. So too are parts of Greenland, Canada, Alaska, and Iceland. Even when summer comes, ice and snow cover about one-tenth of Earth's land surface. The upper slopes and peaks of high mountains all over the world are also covered by ice and snow. These places of everlasting snow are said to be above the snow line. Summertime snow fields are found in the Rockies, Himalayas, Alps, Andes, and even at the equator high atop Mount Kilimanjaro. It is in this constantly cold lands and above the snow line that glaciers are born. So here is a picture that is a photo of what they were talking about. That is Antarctica. That's the South Pole. That is midnight, and it's still light out. That's awesome in the summer, but guess what happens in the winter? It is dark 24 hours a day. So light all day in the, winter, in the summer and then dark in the winter. So very different. A single snowflake is a feathery crystal of ice about the size of your fingernail. Every snowflake is six-sided, yet each has a different shape. Once the spinning flakes fall to the ground, they begin to clump together and lose their pointed beauty. Soon the snowflakes become rounded grains of ice with tiny bubbles of air trapped inside. As more snow falls, the weight of the snow and ice squeezes the grains of ice together, forcing out the trapped air. The color of the ice begins to change, too. The white of airy snow becomes the steel blue of airless ice. Finally, the blue ice crystals begin to pack together into a solid field of ice. So that shows you what an individual snowflake can look like. And then over time, it gets heavier and crushed together into these, to ice that looks like this. And the ice turns a beautiful blue because there's no air inside of it. It's totally airless. Um, I've been on a trip to Iceland and I got to see glaciers and you look at the top of the glacier and it's white and then you look down below and it's just this beautiful deep blue color. As more snow falls, the ice becomes thicker and heavier, pressing downward with great force against the ground. 
As years go by, the ice field grows until it is about 60 feet deep. Then something strange happens. The huge mass of ice begins to move. Hmm, I wonder what would cause it to actually move. The ice bends and cracks and begins to slide over the ground, moving downhill. The ice moves slowly, usually less than two feet a day and sometimes only an inch or two. But however slowly, when an ice field begins to move, it has then become a glacier. So it has to have movement to become a glacier. What would cause the ice to, to come downhill? What would cause it to move? It's gravity. So once gravity is able to pull that ice and the ice starts moving under gravity, then you have a glacier. Glaciers are sometimes called rivers of ice, but a glacier moves differently than a river. Water flows freely, but ice is hard and can crack easily. For many years, scientists called glaciologists have studied how glaciers move. Some of their early findings were accidental. In 1827, one Swiss scientist built a hut on an alpine glacier. When he returned three years later, he found that the hut had moved more than 100 yards downhill. So he comes back and it's moved down the hill. How funny would that be? So here's a great photo of a glacier. So you can see it up here, and then when you get down here, this is all cracks. So as the ice moves, you know, ice isn't like water, it cracks because it's hard. In recent years, scientists have found that glaciers move in two different ways. One way is by sliding across the ground on a very thin film of water from melted ice. This meltwater, sometimes only the thickness of a page in this book, allows the ice to slide. The second way that a glacier moves is called creep. The tremendous weight of the glacier makes the ice crystals slowly form layers one atop another. Then the layers begin gliding or creeping over one another. And gravity is what causes that creep. It pulls the ice down. All glaciers move. Actually, let me show you this first. So this is a diagram here and you can see uh, crevasses, which means cracks in the ice, which can be hundreds of feet deep. You think of cracks like ah, a little tiny crack. These things can be, you can fall into them. They're that deep. Um, and then you can see it shows it sliding. And then the meltwater is down here and it slides on the meltwater. And then the Alpine glacier right here the gravity is pulling it down and they called that creep. All glaciers move in both ways, but some glaciers move more by sliding over the ground while others move more by creeping. The photograph shows the Bird Glacier in Antarctica. Antarctic glaciers move mostly by creeping. So it's a photograph and that's from the air. So that's from an airplane looking down. So those are the mountains there, and then that's the valleys where the ice is flowing through. Different parts of a glacier move at different speeds. Louis Agassiz, a 19th century Swiss naturalist and scientist, once planted rows of stakes in straight lines across a glacier. The following year, Agassiz found that the stakes had all moved down the valley but the stakes in the middle of the glacier had moved the farthest. That showed that the ice in the middle of the glacier was moving faster than ice along the sides. Hmm. Interesting. In the early part of the 20th century, Swiss and Italian scientists drilled holes straight down through the thickness of a glacier. Then they placed iron rods in the holes. Over the years, the scientists found that the rods bent at the top. This showed that the ice at the top of a glacier moves more quickly than ice at the bottom. Nowadays, glaciologists use photograph or photography and other methods to learn about glaciers. The photo shows a scientist using an instrument called a transit to help find out the speed of a glacier. So there's our scientist and there's the glacier down there. So what would cause the glacier to move slower along the sides is that it's near the ground. So the ice near the ground the ground kind of holds it more in place, whereas the ice in the middle, it just moves a lot easier because it's only surrounded by other ice. The thicker the glacier, the faster it moves. That's because the greater weight of the glacier causes 
the ice crystals, the crystals of ice to creep more rapidly. Also, a steep glacier will flow much more quickly than one on level land. Temperature is a third factor that affects the speed of a glacier. The warmer the glacier, the faster the ice moves because there is a greater amount of meltwater beneath the ice. In fact, scientists sometimes group glaciers together depending upon whether they are cold or warm. But even warm glaciers are still freezing. Some glaciers move so slowly that you might not notice their movement for a long time. The cold Alaskan glaciers in this aerial photo creep downhill at only about six inches per year. That's slow. But there are some steep, warm glaciers that flow more than 100 feet a day. So this is the aerial photograph. So you're in an airplane looking down, and those are all like the mountains. Those are the mountain peaks. See, they're covered in snow. And then all of these, they look like rivers. Those are the glaciers. So the ice and snow builds up here, and then under gravity, it pulls and comes down here in that process that they were calling creep. As the glacier moves, the ice on top bends and sometimes cracks. The cracks in the ice are called crevasses. The crevasses can be deep and wide and very dangerous. This group of scientists exploring the Juneau ice field in Canada has to travel carefully. When glaciers move, they grind and crush everything in their path. Small stones and huge rocks are pulled from the ground and carried along. Slowly, but with irresistible force, glaciers cut and carve the land. Trees, forests, hills, and even mountains are ground down over the years. The photo shows how most of the mountain has been carried away by the ice, leaving sharp peaks and ragged ridges. So here you see people, and look how deep, these are the cracks or the crevasses right here that's a person so you can see how massive those get but look how dirty the the top of the glacier gets it's like when it snows in the city and then a few days later it kind of gets grimy and then this right here is what they were showing so when you see mountains this jagged that is a sure tail sign that is there's glaciers involved because the glaciers and the ice have pulled down the rock into the valley and it leaves these jagged edges. As glaciers move, they often scratch lines into the layers of rock that lie beneath the soil. The scratches are made by smaller rocks carried along by the ice. Sometimes glaciers wear down the bedrock to smooth rounded humps. To some people, these rocks have the shapes of a flock of grazing sheep. So they are called roche moutonne, which is the French word that means sheep rocks. The rocks carried along by glaciers are broken down and ground into smaller and smaller pieces. The smaller pieces are ground again and again until they are very tiny particles, almost too small for you to see. These particles are called rock flour, and they are carried away by a glacier's meltwater. Rock flour carried by the meltwater stream from a glacier has turned the seawater a grayish brown color. So here's those Roche Moutonnet, they look like I don't really think they look like sheep, but whatever, somebody did. <laughs> and you can see all that grinding. That was the glaciers, the ice scooped over it. It ground and scraped that rock. And then right here, all that rock flour turns the water kind of that brownish color, grayish brown color. And that is the glacier coming down. And that's the very end of the glacier where it starts melting. Not all of the rocks carried by a glacier are ground into rock flour. Some of the rocks are left behind along the edges or at the end of a glacier. Sometimes these rocks build up into ridges or piles called moraines. You can see the moraines in this photo of the Worthington Glacier in Alaska. There are many types of glaciers. Mountain glaciers start as snowflakes atop mountains. Then they begin to move downward following valleys until they reach the snow line and melt during the summer. Mountain glaciers are often thousands of feet wide and many miles long. Avalanches of snow roar down their surface. Sometimes mountain glaciers do not melt when they reach the bottom of the mountain. Instead, the glaciers flow over the countryside to form ice fields over level ground. So right here, this one, there's the glacier all there. And then that little mountain was the land that the glacier brought down. And then it melted 
and then you're left with this kind of little mountain here, this little hill. And then here, all the mountains, all the snow, and then the glacier just comes right down into the valley. Bigger than most mountain glaciers are ice caps, mountain glaciers that have become so thick that the mountain is almost buried. This computer colored photo of Iceland was taken by satellite. The red spots are hot, active volcanoes. Ah, volcanoes, which we first learned about. The green and the yellow areas are places where the temperatures are medium, the smaller white spots are mountain glaciers, and the large white areas are ice caps. Iceland's largest ice cap covers more than 3,000 square miles. There is an active volcano buried beneath the western part of that ice cap. The heat from the volcano is always melting the ice above, forming a huge reservoir of meltwater. Every five years or so, the meltwater bursts out from under an edge of the cap. The roaring waters carry large boulders and giant blocks of ice. For miles around, the land is flooded and becomes a vast lake. All right. So there's that aerial shot of Iceland. So it's more moderate temperature, and then there's the ice caps right there the big ice caps, and then these smaller ones are in the mountains, and those are your uh, mountain glaciers. See right there. Iceland is one of the prettiest places I've ever been, and it stays light there 24 hours a day in the summer as well, so. Ice sheets are the largest kind of glaciers. The Antarctic ice sheet is the biggest in the world. It is larger than the United States, Mexico, and Central America combined. In some places, the Antarctic ice sheet is more than 15,000 feet thick. That's about three miles thick. That's some thick ice. That's about the height of 10 Empire State Buildings stacked one atop another. Where an ice sheet meets the sea, it forms an ice shelf over the water. Large masses of ice often break away from glaciers or ice shelves. The glacier is said to be calving and the floating blocks of ice are called icebergs. So here now we're gonna start learning about icebergs. So the glacier meets the water and you have this big beautiful cliff of ice that's all ice. And then here is another cliff of ice. And then once it gravity eventually pulls it into the water, you have a big chunk of ice and that's where you get your iceberg. The icebergs in this photo are 80 to 100 feet high and several miles long. Each is a floating island of ice. The largest iceberg ever measured was about 200 miles long and 60 miles wide. That's bigger than the state of Vermont or the country of Belgium. As an iceberg floats, it melts, changes shape, and breaks apart. Until an iceberg melts and disappears completely, most of it is underwater. And you can test that by putting a, a, a piece of ice in a glass of water. And if you look at it, most of the ice is going to be below the water line only a little piece sticks up. So glaciers are the exact same way. So these are what fresh glaciers look like. They're huge chunks of ice. And then over time, they melt and form these really beautiful odd shapes. Only a small part of an iceberg shows above the water. About seven eighths of the berg what they call it, is hidden beneath the waves because glacial ice is slightly lighter than an equal amount of seawater. The large unseen parts of an iceberg adds to the danger of a collision with a nearby ship and the famous collision of all times I'm going to tell you about right now. On the night of April 14th, 1912, the Titanic, the so-called safest ship in the world, according to its builders, was steaming across the North Atlantic. Yet in a few hours, the ship had gone to the bottom of the ocean after striking a large iceberg. More than 1,500 people died in the icy waters that night. The next year, the International Ice Patrol was established and is still on the job. The patrol searches for dangerous icebergs and helps ships to avoid them. In the future, icebergs may prove to be useful as a source of fresh water for dry lands. One plan calls for mile-long Antarctic icebergs to be towed to distant countries by powerful tugboats and helicopters. The icebergs would be wrapped with layers of plastic insulation to protect them from melting on their journey. But there are still many problems with this idea and it may be many years, if ever, before icebergs are transported this way. All right, 
right, we are almost done. 20,000 years ago, ice sheets covered most of Canada, all of New England, and much of the Midwestern and Northwestern United States. Most of Great Britain and large parts of the Soviet Union, Germany, and Poland, along with smaller parts of Austria, Italy, and France, were also covered by ice. Then about 10,000 years ago, the ice began to melt. Today, glaciers are found only in the cold polar regions, like the Arctic and Antarctica, and in high mountains. During the past million years, glaciers and ice sheets have advanced and covered large parts of the Earth at least four times, and perhaps as many as ten times. Scientists call this period of time the Pleistocene Ice Ages. Today we can see the ways that the land was changed by glaciers. The rivers of ice cut valleys through the land and made rolling hills. Rocks and boulders were dragged from one place and dropped in another place far away. Perhaps the place where you live now was once covered by ice. If you look around, you may find clues to past ice ages. Scratches on bedrock, a big boulder that's just in the middle of a field, or a round pond left behind as the ice melted. So here you can tell this was once covered by glaciers because you have all these little pockets where they're now filled with water. So a lot of lakes. Plus, if you're ever out in a field anywhere and you see a gigantic boulder, you can almost guarantee that it was brought down by a glacier, and then once the glacier melt, what does the boulder do? It doesn't go back home, it just drops right where the glacier left it. Will the Great Ice Ages ever return? Will ice sheets eventually bury New York, Chicago, London, Montreal, and other cities of the north? Or is our climate getting warmer, melting the huge polar ice fields and raising the level of the oceans? Some scientists say that the last century has been the warmest in the past 4,000 years, and it may become even warmer in the next century. Many mysteries remain. Scientists continue to study the ice ages and glaciers of today. And little by little, the world of ice is yielding its secrets to science. All right. So that was Icebergs and Glaciers by Seymour Simon. I apologize. This is all backwards, but uh, it is what it is. All right. Well, that's it. So I appreciate you guys joining me today for our reading about icebergs and glaciers. Um, and I look forward to seeing you next Friday and actually next Friday, I am going to be in a different part of the country. So you will not see this background. You're going to see, I don't know what background, but something different cause I'm not going to be here. So anyway, have a great weekend, everybody. And I will see you next week.